talks uh, continue with uh, Stephen Connolly, who is uh, a professor at Berkeley and um, um, has been working a lot on magnetic particle imaging, which is kind of, well, a complementary technique to uh, MRI and, and has the same problems, but uh, has some advantages in, in quantitative imaging, perhaps. So, um, uh, Stephen, uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. I think you should be able to share. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone, especially for uh, Cornelius's patience <laughs> getting my setup. Let's see. All right. Can people see that? Yes, looks perfect. Great. All right. So, um, you know, I have a disclosure to make. I'm a co founder and I own stock in Magnetic Insight. Um, and I'm a professor both in bioengineering and electrical engineering at UC Berkeley. So people may remember, some of the older people here may remember that I was an MRI researcher for 20 odd years, mostly at Stanford and electrical engineering, working with this crew. Um, I worked on a number of different projects in MRI, um, but I'm only gonna highlight a couple of slides from an effort uh, almost you know, 20 years ago on pre-polarized MRI. It's kind of seeing a resurgence now that 0.55 Tesla MRI is becoming um, more popular again. And so the idea is very simple, is to have a strong B0 during the TR recovery time to increase your M0, but then have a weak B0 field during the readout to reduce air tissue artifacts. So you sort of get the best of both worlds if you build everything just right. You get the signal to noise ratio of the stronger B field um, and the contrast of the, of the stronger field and the susceptibility artifacts of the weaker field. And David Lurie's working on similar things at Everton. So um, it, we, we actually built three different MRI scanners from scratch um, with Greg Scott and myself and others uh, we, using a 0.5 Tesla um, polarizing field during the TR time and 100 millitesla field during readout. And the cost was actually very, very small. And the image quality was pretty darn good. Um, you can actually see right close to the metal artifacts in this um, forearm of a patient. This is stainless and these are titanium screws. But you can see that there's minimal distortion only because it's at 130 millitesla in this image. Whereas the 1.5T spin echo image, she's a lot of distortion. And let's see, there we go. And so we also built a knee scanner, just never been published. Um, here's a 1.5 T scanner on a normal volunteer. You can make out all of the good uh, cartilage. And you can see that the signal to noise ratio is down. Um, we didn't optimize the RF coil, but it's a pretty good image for this kind of cost. Um, and we probably pushed the acquisition time and resolution a little further than our SNR would permit. Um, but there was a very nice, um, reduction of the susceptibility difference or the chemical shift difference between the fat and the bone and the cartilage. So for the last 10 years, I've pretty much been working mostly on magnetic particle imaging. Um, and this has been very exciting. Um, and so let me see if I can, yeah, that's better. And, and so the idea here is um, it's an entirely new imaging method. There are no human MPI scanners yet. In my own lab, we've proven that it could be useful for these applications. And as I mentioned, we have a startup company launched five years ago. So we're imaging the same MPI. Um, the MPI tracers are very similar to MRI T2 star agents, but instead of negative contrast, we actually have positive contrast inherently. We had to build um, these scanners and we built about six of these uh, scanners in my lab at Berkeley and now at the startup. And this is the value proposition right here. So this is a GI bleed model, and this is a control animal. And the X-ray is simply there for anatomic reference. And you can see this extravasation of the iron oxide nanoparticles that were injected into the tail vein of the animal. And you can make out this gastrointestinal bleed very, very well. And this doesn't compete at all with MRI. It really competes with a RBC scintigraphy study in nuclear medicine, okay? And so you can actually get an appreciation 
through this. This is a legal injection of iron oxide nanoparticles in this tube, and this is the scan you get. Um, and it's, because it's all magnetic fields under two megahertz, there's absolutely no effect from tissue. We only see the nanoparticles through their nonlinear effects. We do not see tissue whatsoever. So it's ideal for vascular, stem cell, or T cell labeling. There's zero background signal, linear positive contrast, and we can actually get to 20 cell, cell sensitivity very soon, and it's perfectly linear and quantitative. And it really will work at any depth if you can build the scanner. Um, compared to nuclear medicine, it's great that it has an infinite half-life. So the superpower, if you will, for MPI is that these SBIOs saturate at about 0.6 Tesla, right? And so in MRI, when we use T2 star MRI to detect their presence, we're actually detecting them with a much, much smaller mu zero M naught. It's up to 22 million times weaker than what the SPIOs are. So if we can directly detect the SPIOs, we get a huge boost in SNR. And in fact, we can see micromolar concentrations with MPI. Now, if you're paying um, as MRI people, you probably noticed that that's not entirely fair because MRI has endogenous 55 molar water, and that's absolutely true. But MRI can't really see micromolar concentrations of tracers. So MPI does not compete with MRI. It really is a zero rapid zero radiation uh, complement to nuclear medicine studies. So we've gone through three phases in the last decade from building scanners, coming up with the way the uh, image reconstruction algorithm should work. Then we went into applications the last five years. And now recently we've started building MPI tailored SPIOs. And I'm just gonna fly through some of the applications. Here you can see we can image stem cells after day one after tail vein injection, they're stuck in the lungs. By day 12, they've migrated to the liver and spleen through normal processes. Here you can see the world's first uh, MPI cancer scan. Um, I already talked about the GI bleed. And we can also image both lung, lung ventilation and perfusion. This is a perfusion scan, and it's a beautiful uh, replication of what we do in standard uh, VQ studies. And I'll talk also about WBC studies. Okay, so if you guys all know MRI, the physics of MPI is quite a bit different. We have a saturation curve that you need to think about. Any field over about five millitesla means that you get um, full saturation like this. And so that's a very weak field. Um, these are about 25 nanometer particles with huge MSAT. Um, and to make an image, this is it. There's no Lamour equation or nothing. All, the, all we have is a very strong field gradient. The iron oxide's adiabatically linked to the instantaneous field, which is now negative for both. Say this is in the left and the right, right eye. As we sweep the left eye and then the right eye, SBIOs flip. And then we get the voltage induced in a coil. So there's no K space, it's, it's just X space MPI. Um, and we've actually formally derived the point spread function. Um, which is really just the derivative of that nonlinear saturation curve. Um, and so we're stuck right now with MRI um, SPIOs, but we're now designing an SPIO that's much better. And instead of having a 10 millitesla full with half max, it's all the way down to one millitesla. And this will make a huge improvement because then the uh, MPI human scanner would go down by a factor of 100 in cost. And so this is some of our first data um, with this new MPI tracer. Believe it or not, these are called super ferromagnetic, which I hadn't heard of even a couple of years ago, but we believe that's what's going on here. This is not deconvolution at all. This is just using better tracers. Um, and so we're working on this, and this will allow for much um, cheaper um, uh, scanners, much more affordable, like a low field MRI scanner. So we're getting both a 10-fold resolution and a 10-fold sensitivity boost with these super ferromagnetic tracers. So we've been trying to figure it all out. We've done some nanophysics, uh, nanoscale physics modeling, and we think chain formation is causing this effect. And the only evidence I'm going to offer you is that 
the data that we get, these are MH curves um, that we've measured. And this is a simulation of the dipole field within a chain, um, the dipole fields from adjacent particles affecting that Langevin curve. And sure enough, we're getting qualitatively a very good match between the blue curve, which is a little bit more shallow, and then the red curve, which is this unbelievable steep MH curve that gives us huge SNR and really good spatial resolution. So I mentioned that if we can get this 10 times better particle to work in vivo, then it'll reduce the cost of a human MPI scanner to about a quarter of a million dollars, much more affordable. And I, I should mention, it's kind of obvious that it would also make DBDT and SAR electromagnetic safety much, much better. Now I just want to fly through some applications. I've already talked about stem cell imaging. You can see it's a 3D study. In the CT study here, the, the uh, iron oxide nanoparticles were in the lungs, but they were 100% invisible to the CT scan. Um, this is an exciting future application when we make a human MPI scanner. We're basically replicating a uh, decades old experiment done routinely in nuclear medicine until maybe 20 years ago, which was to inject macroaggregated albumin, which we called MAA, and then put a radioactive label on it, technetium. Um, and it's designed, 40 microns is designed to trap in the capillaries, which are six microns in a mouse or in a human. Um, and so basically it's a study of, of trapping a totally brilliant study um, because there's a billion capillaries. And so the 1.6 million won't uh, kill the, the patient. Um, and so we were able to just replace this by just substituting the iron oxide for the technetium and it worked right away. And you'll notice that we don't have any of the B0 um, of headaches that MRI has. We, we need to have something like 10% field homogeneity, not 10 parts per million. And that's one of the superpowers of MPI. So we can also do lung ventilation here. We just put SBIOs, mixed it into an aerosol. This is almost like a vape pen, if you will, um, breathed into the alveolar side of the lungs and you can actually make out this beautifully. And so it's great, there's no hot chemistry, means much, much faster um, and it's radiation free. Um, this is a very common study, GI bleeds after a car accident or other, um, there's 300,000 hospitalizations just in the US. And so RBC technetium is, is used because it sees the smallest bleed. They take out your red blood cells, they label them with technetium, re-inject them, and then they do a digital subtraction experiment to see where um, the red blood cells are accumulating. And sure enough, um, problems with it is four millimeter resolution, three hours and pretty high cost in dose. And it's an emergency read. So three hours is kind of out of the um, question. And so we used a, a long circulating nanoparticle from load spin labs. And then um, we would get almost four hour half-life. And then you can actually see this extravasation in this gut bleed model. And you can see that the digital subtraction and geography is just perfect on the wild type animal. So this is a, you know, it, it's not maybe as um, enthralling as cancer, but this is a real world study and MPI is already beating the sensitivity uh, uh, and a mass limited basis for, uh, for GI bleeds compared to RBC scintigraphy. Obviously one of the biggest applications would be for cancer screening. PET is by far the most reliable imaging tool. Um, and if we could get to early stage cancer diagnosis, that would be a major win. Um, and, and we all know that there are a lot of false negatives in dead and spress. Um, MPI can see through any tissue, bone, um, lungs, it doesn't matter. And so it would be great if we could actually get, say, five to one contrast to pick up of the nanoparticles in a tumor, because then it would be very, very easy for us to image it. And we wouldn't have this problem here where you see this mammogram missed this breast tumor, uh, whereas the Sestamibi technetium tracer saw it. Um, and so we did our first study here with an untargeted nanoparticle, and it's just extravasated through the EPR effect. But you can see the, the basic problem with targeting cancer is that the liver and spleen really take up most of the particles. So this one worked great. 
some tumors, if they're close to the liver and spleen, it might not be as exciting. So what we're trying to do is to use the body's own um, cancer targeting system, white blood cells, to highlight in here infection. So this is a standard uh, white blood cell scintigraphy study. You can actually make out this infection in the heel of this diabetic patient beautifully. Um, and the idea is you take out autologous white blood cells, label them with indium-111, which has a 2.8 day half-life, and then the white blood cells home to infection. All right. And so we can do the same thing. We just published the first paper on an external uh, antibody SPIO tracer that targets neutrophils in circulation. And then we can see them then target myeloid bone marrow afterwards. And you can make out the skull here pretty well. So what we're aiming to do next is to make this work with CAR T cells, because of course you're modifying the CAR T cell before injecting. Um, and we need monitoring for solid tumors, which is about 90% of all tumors. Um, CAR T cell and CAR NK cell are the two of the most promising treatments. Um, and to date, most of the immunotherapies have really been a, a, a big success only in bloodborne tumors, the 10% of all tumors. So CAR T cells, unfortunately, will not survive indium-111 or technetium-99M. They're a lot more sensitive than say neutrophils um, or macrophages. So we think that this is a, a very compelling application for uh, MPI in the future. All right, so in conclusion, MPI has really superb sensitivity on the order of micromolar. Um, it has superb contrast and safety. It's already offers major advantages over scintigraphy and SPECT. Um, I, I would say we're, the jury is still out whether we can compete with PET. Um, but we could radically improve uh, MPI resolution with the superferromagnetic particles instead of superparamagnetic particles. We already routinely see a tenfold boost in both resolution and SNR. And we're really working furiously to try to make this safe for an in vivo uh, um, administration. And we think this will reduce the cost of human MPI to 0.3 Tesla MRI, pretty affordable. And we think that um, one of the key first killer apps, if you will, um, is gonna be monitoring CAR T cell. Um, and so I'd just like to acknowledge some funding. I know I went through a lot of slides very quickly. So my email address is right here, if there are any questions and that's it. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. That was uh, really fascinating. Um, I mean, this is really complementary to MRI. Um, we have a, um, a question on the chat. Actually, we have several questions on the chat. Um, so what is the footprint of your um, scanner? It's been asked by Tom and Kilo. So it, it, it weighs about a uh, metric ton and it, um, Let's see, let's see, stop sharing, that might help. <laughs> That's better. So it, it weighs about a metric ton. And so the footprint is kind of similar to a um, small animal MRI, because this is a, also a small animal MPI. Um, this doesn't need a screen room um, because it's so much lower frequency than an MRI. Um, and so the, the, the latest commercial scanner, it, it's, it's tabletop, but it's not your normal tabletop. It can handle that okay. kind of weight. Need a very strong table. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, uh, Joe uh, writes in the chat, I think you can see that great talk. Some pet traces cross the blood brain barrier. Any indication that MPI particles would reach the brain for neuro applications? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, probably not. <laughs> and, and so, okay, so you know, the, the, the in normal bed, brain, blood brain barrier is thought to be impermeable. These are about 100 nanometers hydrodynamic diameter. Um, and it's normally thought to be impermeable to that. Now, there's a lot of people who think that neurodegenerative diseases are, may have some effect on the blood brain barrier and it might be leakier. So we've been working with Daniela Koffer at Berkeley on that. Um, but 100 nanometers is kind of big for the <laughs> blood brain barrier. And so the, um, however, and this is, I think even more important, I think that 
the extravasation of nanoparticles to cancer is also a permeation problem. I think that everybody, one of the big problems is say you have a great binder to a tumor cell, right? To this outside of a tumor cell, but your nanoparticle is inside the vein, right? So it's at least 20 microns, maybe 200 microns away. So that chemical binding has no effect at that kind of distance, right? And so it has to find a way through hopefully a leaky vein endothelial layer to get to binding to the tumor. And so that is why we did a non-targeted um, EPR effect, because if the EPR effect is an effect, it takes more than a few hours for it to leak back into either lymph or into circulation. And so, you know, it, it, the, the binding to a tumor may not be all that helpful for a short study like this. So, so I think that using white blood cells to traverse that endothelial layer is useful in both cancer as well as in um, getting to the blood brain barrier. And any sort of disease process in the brain should excite some white blood cells. And they know how to look for P selectins and E selectins, and then they extravasate through diapedesis, which is way smarter than anything we can do. <laughs> okay, I see there's really a lot of applications in the future to come for MPI.